other books that Paul has written, but uh, today we're going to look at the conclusion. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 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 <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> our God and our Father, we do realize that sometimes we come to a conclusion of a letter, an epistle, and sometimes we don't look as closely in the conclusion as we do in the introduction or, or in, especially in the body. But we pray, Father, that the things that are said here in conclusion might be something that uh, speaks to our heart, to our life, and uh, becomes uh, a motivator for us uh, to continue on the fellowship and the gospel that we've been learning about in this book of Philippians. So bless our hearts with this message in, this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. The uh, Verse 21, you can see he is going for the conclusion of the letter, and he just simply says, and interesting, the three groups there, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. Then he says, the brethren which are with me greet you, all the saints salute you. Uh, I'm impressed with the, the every saint and all the saints and all the, even the saints that are with him. Uh, there's this greeting of one another, this uh, 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 expression of dearment to, to one another, uh, appreciation of one another that we're reminded there to, to greet the saints. I, I tell you often about the different things that I pray about, especially before we have a, a fellowship time here like this. I certainly pray about your presence. I, I do that constantly, some of you by name and, and, then, uh, and others that you just continue on to do, what, the, make the right decisions. Um, but anyhow, among the uh, other things that I pray, I pray about how you greet one another. That there really is an appreciation for one another when you come together. And I do pray that you express that appreciation. And of course we just enjoyed mid-morning fellowship. And, uh, and hopefully that is part of greeting one another and getting to know one another. But so Paul when he says that here, I mean every saint, make sure you're not leaving somebody out. And then all the saints salute you. There's, there's all the saints in other places that are greeting you. There is this uh, this 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 of mutual affection uh, among the brotherhood of, in Jesus Christ. You, you might, some of you might be surprised that well, every saint salute you. you. You think that those are some kind of people up there with the angels that have special identification by church history to be some benefit to you. Some people pray to saints and that type of thing. But Paul's talking about those that are alive, those that are with him, those in other places. What a saint is is someone who's been sanctified in Christ Jesus. The word sanctified is to be made a saint. Sanctified means to be set apart from the world, belonging to God for his use. And when we talked about in our opening song about being saved, when a person comes to understand that they're a sinner, and there's nothing that you can do in yourself by your own power to get rid of your sin. I don't know if you've ever tried. You can beg you know, someone else to forgive you, but then you still got God to deal with. And, and God does not, you read the Bible, God never forgives apart from blood. There's always blood associated with forgiveness. Back in the Old Testament, animals were dying as a substitute, as a type of, God can't forgive because he's just. And he's got to hold somebody accountable. And there was a substitutionary payment in the, in the sense of animals. But that really, Hebrews tells us, could never really take away sin. That was just a picture and a type and a shadow until God's Son, Jesus Christ, came into the world, lived a sinless life, and then died on a cross to pay for all of our sins. And now we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And when you come to understand that Jesus Christ paid for all your sins because you couldn't pay for them yourself unless you go to hell, you don't want to go to hell, you've got to have an escape, and Jesus Christ is your salvation. The one who paid for your sins, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, not only does God save you from hell, forgive you your sins, He imputes righteousness to your account, declares you to be righteous before the judgment bar of heaven, according to His justice system, you're declared righteous, you're given the Holy Spirit, the gift of eternal life, and you're going to have everlasting life, but you become His possession. You're sanctified, set apart as His forever. 
So when Paul says, all the saints salute you, we're talking about the saved people in the world. Those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, all the saints salute you. They that are with me greet you. All, uh, 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 all, uh, uh, and then he says, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. So th that's what that's talking about. And if I get a little bit, even though uh, I'm going to get a little away from that just a second, just some things that just recently took place that made me stop and, and, and think about when it says like every saint and all the saints. Uh, sometimes we think we're a special group. And we are. We have our place in the body of Christ of standing for God's word rightly divided, standing for the King James Bible, standing for God's word rightly divided, to know who the Apostle Paul is, what the dispensation of grace is, what God is actually doing today. There's a lot of mixed messages out in the world because people haven't learned to believe the Bible, to rightly divide the Bible, to understand where they are in God's place, in God. God's program. There's a time past, there's a time present, there's a future day of wrath coming to this world, there's a thousand year reign of Christ that's coming to this world. But we're not in that thousand years and we're not in the day of wrath, we're in the dispensation of grace and we know who, who God used to tell us the information about how to live in the dispensation of grace. And that's the Apostle Paul, that's why we're studying his epistle. Anyhow, we have our place in the body of Christ, but you know, we're not all there is. And boy am I glad of that. When you think about, when it says, greet all the saints, I wish every saint, every saint, God's will is for all men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth, and you're not going to come to the knowledge of the truth unless you rightly divide the word of truth. So I wish everyone got there, but some who aren't quite in, on the same page in those areas still are doing some things before God that just, uh, just amazes me and astounds me. There, there's a, a man, uh, Bob Barlow. You're never going to meet, meet him probably. He's near the end of his life, I think. Uh, but he's a man who just took up uh, going to China and teaching English in China. And he did this years ago. And he's been in jail several times, has been beaten to the point of death for sharing the gospel there in China. Every time they let him out, he might come back for the United States for a little furlough, he goes back again. They have smuggled Grace School of the Bible into China, and 12,000 copies have been made since he's been there. I mean, this, this man is doing great things and he's just, you know, a real nobody, really. And he's a delightful person when you meet him. He, he, he's exceptional. But, uh, but anyhow, he, he's a Gail Ripplinger comes on the scene in a time where people are departing like mad from the King James Bible and says, wait, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> what are you departing from? And she starts exposing the errors and what's going on in the new translations and why the King James shows to be the, the inspired word of God preserved for English-speaking people. She actually put out a book, just used her initials because she figured nobody's going to listen to a woman. And, and she's right about that. But she, in her humility and taking the back seat, she's taken a real stand that, that some men didn't take and has caused others to take it. So we're thankful. A man, Les Feldick. Now some of you know about him. He got pretty popular. When we went on television, we thought we were going to be the only grace work on TV. Found out he's been there before us, and man, he's exposed more people to the truth of right division in his simple teaching way, and, uh, and has caused right division to be spread throughout our country in a, in, in, a, in a greater way than perhaps Stam and Baker and others that we looked at as previous people who have written books that, that would help people to see the truth of God's Word. The, the, this gets a little controversial, perhaps, but Dennis Devo, Devoza, the president of King's College, and I'll let you figure out from there who I'm talking about. That man has an ability to look and to understand how culture is formed, how, how, uh, uh, how uh, ethics are formed, how, how even governmental thinking takes place in the mind of someone, and, and has put out a, 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 not only a book but a movie that it's just astounding that God raised up a man that has such insight. Forget his political view for a moment, just the insight this man has. And I'm thinking to myself, man, God does have some people out there that are making an impact in society. Uh, we, we watched, Sanjay and I watched the movie called Fireproof. Have you all seen that? I was always told to watch that. Jim Pittman told me <laughs> probably two years ago to watch that. And here's this actor who became a Christian at Kurt Cam Cameron. Excellent movie. The gospel could be clearer. Like I say, not everybody does exactly. And it, but anyhow, that man has, uh, has put out a movie, and I'm thinking, this is in, in the local 
the movie play, the DVD places where you go rent a DVD. I can't believe that something like that got in there and uh, so exposed the Christianity and the life of Christ in a believer and almost gives the gospel kind of clearly. <laughs> I'll let you figure that out on yourself. My point is, is, is that uh, there are just people all over. I got a call this week from a man, his church down in Ohio. They're set up, they set up a booth in the, uh, in the, in the fair down there having in Ohio. So far, he's got nine people saved. He said, can you send me dictionary of the gospel as fast as you can? And there, there are just all kinds of people out there doing all kinds of things. And when I read this verse, I realize that when it says, uh, 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 um, the saint, uh, salute every saint in Christ Jesus, and then verse 22, all the saints salute you, that we need to appreciate other members in the body of Christ. And, and certainly that's what Paul is talking about here as he addresses the book. I think things were a little bit different in his time, but I'll get back to some of that in a moment. When he says salute there, every saint in Christ Jesus and the, the, the brethren that are with me greet thee, you can see that salute actually means to greet. Uh, that that it's, it's right there in the word itself. That it means to salute someone means to welcome. But, it, but it, more than just welcome, it's to embrace. And uh, our, our custom is a handshake, but more and more it does become an actual embrace. There's a passage in the scripture that says, greet one another with a holy kiss. So that, that shows you the closeness of it. Uh, it means to address each other with kindness, with courtesy, with honor, with respect, and goodwill. It actually has an idea as well is to leave that way. So that you greet one another this way and, and all that, you know, wishing each other goodwill, honor, respect. Um, that's not always seen among the brotherhood. Now there is places in scripture and we could actually teach a different, uh, different uh, the other side of the coin on this, that there are those that you are to mark and to avoid. But there is a lot more fighting probably that goes on in the body of Christ that needs to be. And, you know, God will judge all those things. But there's a lot of people that talk about others with disrespect, no honor, and there's just a lot of fighting among us. And, and when Paul deals with people who are unforgiving, he says we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. <laughs> that's a way of Satan to divide the body of Christ, and so there is a spiritual warfare that goes on. But that's what that means. Well, you know, this conclusion of the book of Philippians fits the very theme that we've been studying. Paul's not just expressing something as he's closing here. This is something Paul has been expressing all the way through the book of Philippians. Go back to chapter 1. And I remind you of the introduction of how the book begins, what Paul actually, after he does an introduction, actually says why he's writing. He says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And don't forget, when you read that until now, it didn't mean it ended then. <laughs> it's just that it's going to continue after this point, but from the beginning until now. And then it, it goes on. In fact, you see it goes on in verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. The day of Jesus Christ is the day Jesus Christ is going to leave heaven and meet us in the air. He's going to come down. He's got to call us up. And we get caught up to meet him in the air. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's going to be a rapture that's going to take place someday of the body of Christ. And whether you're a dead member of the body of Christ or a living member of the body of Christ, you're going to be caught up to meet the Lord. What Paul is saying here, he's bragging about their fellowship in the gospel from the first day that he shared the gospel with them until the day he wrote this letter. And then he's, he says God is going to continue that work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. So it's a, he's enjoying, it, he's appreciating their fellowship in the gospel that's been from the very beginning and continues on and hopefully will continue on until the day of Christ. Verse 7 says, Even as it, it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in, the, in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. The grace that was given to the Apostle Paul for him to first receive and then to deliver to us. These people got saved by the grace of God and continued in that grace. It's called the fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And so he's, as he says, salute every saint and every saint salute you. You can see there's a fellowship in the gospel that Paul appreciates and that these people are involved in. And that's kind of what he's talking about in the conclusion there. Uh, these people have 
put their, their life and work with the Apostle Paul in getting the gospel out. And not only in the, gos the gospel, it says the defense and confirmation of the gospel. They're defending the gospel and they're, they're confirming the gospel. They're partakers of his grace so that they are uh, contending for the gospel. They're, they're careful to be uncompromising in doctrine, uncompromising in purpose, and unhindered in their duty to get the gospel out. So as the book of Philippians began this way, it, it ends that way by the encouragement or the idea of encouraging one another uh, in the Lord and, and to appreciate one another and the work of the ministry that needs to, be go, to go on. So I actually look at chapter 4, uh, uh, the conclusion here in these verses, as carrying on the fellowship in the gospel. It's not the end of the book. They're going to continue until the day of Jesus Christ, that God will continue to work in you for that purpose. And, and therefore, even as the book con concludes, it's a continuation of going out and, and sharing the gospel with others, carrying on the message. So back to chapter 4, verse 21. When it says, Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. Uh, greet you. Uh, all the saints salute you. One of the things that we have to be careful about, after I said all that positive, is sometimes it's real difficult figuring out who a saint is. <laughs> because, you know, it says, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. Well, they don't have a number on their head, 777, so I know that they belong to the Lord. <laughs> you know, if every lost person had 666, so as they will someday, you would understand who they are, where they stand. There is no such numbers. How do you know? I mean, when we come together, how do we know greeting here or greeting especially as we leave here? Here, the ones who come on a regular basis, we know what we believe. We know what we stand for. We come for that reason. So it's pretty easy to greet the saints on a Sunday morning, Wednesday, or whenever time we get together. But when it comes to other people out there, there's all kinds of churches, all kinds of things being taught. How do you know... <laughs> Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. Who's a saint and who ain't? Well, I've already shared with you how someone becomes sanctified in Christ Jesus. When Paul said over there in chapter 1, you're all partakers of my grace. That's the only way to become a saint in Christ Jesus. Trouble is when you trust. Now the grace is getting what you do not deserve and cannot earn. You don't deserve salvation and you can't earn it. It says the wages of sin is death. And it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You deserve death, but you can have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when you trust the fact that Christ paid for your sin, God gives you that gift of eternal life, and that's when you become a saint. But you can't see that. You, you, can't, you don't know who is, who isn't, who's thinking about it, who hasn't decided, who won't even think about it. You, you don't know who that is. There's a lot of people that give no thought of God, no thought of the real cross work of Christ and go to church every single Sunday. So how in the world are you going to fulfill that verse? Well, I'm not, the whole message isn't on that, but I just want to say this to you, to warn you, we're not just talking about church people. See, in Paul's day, every church was a Pauline, mid acts dispensational Bible church. Amen. Everyone. <clears throat> Everyone among the Gentiles. Because, see, Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. He took God's message of grace to the Gentiles. They're worshiping other gods. They're worshiping idols. And he tells the Gentiles how God loved them, how Jesus Christ came and died for them, rose again from the dead, and will give them eternal life if they'll trust in him and the finished work that he's accomplished on the cross for them. And Gentiles all over the world began to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Paul then appoints elders and forms a church as a local assembly of believers and he appoints elders in every local area and every church in Paul's day was a Pauline mid-acts dispensational Bible church so when Paul says that here you know they know to greet the church at Ephesus the churches of the Galatians uh, and, you know the, the churches that are mentioned in the Bible but years have gone by now and Satan has so diluted the body of Christ that people name the name of Christ Say they trust in him to be a payment for their sins and then go and try to work their sins off through penance, baptisms, confessions. They do everything trying to get rid of their own sin because they're taught that by their church rather than taught by their church to trust the finished work of Christ. Amen. So that kind of leads you to the answer. The answer of how you would know who a saint is since you can't look and see it 
on their forehead, or you can't look into their heart like God can. You have to listen for them to declare themselves to be a believer. Someone's going to have to tell you they're a believer. And they're going to have to profess Paul's gospel when they profess the gospel. They can't give you the gospel of the kingdom. They, didn't, they can't say, I did what John the Baptist said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, because that's what John called the nation of Israel to do, and that's why he baptized them in the river Jordan, and, and calling the nation of Israel to water baptism is something that every time Israel ever met with God, they came through water cleansing. You're not Israel. God didn't send you John the Baptist. That's not your message for today. So the only way you know who a saint in Christ Jesus is, is they have to tell you they are. And they have to tell you that they are because of Paul's gospel. Now they might not use that term, but they have to say it's through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing they've done but what Christ has done for them. And that there came a time in their life that they trusted that gospel. Then, then now you know to greet them that way. So, so a little information concerning saluting the brethren and, and all. Now when it says, salute every saint in Christ Jesus... He also says, the brethren which are with me greet you. If you just want to write down Colossians chapter 4, and I'll let you just read the whole chapter, it won't hurt you. Uh, but in Colossians chapter 4, he wrote that probably near the same time that he wrote the book of Philippians. We know that Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon were written about the same time. Philippians could actually be a little bit different. But we know Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon were written right at the same time. Had the, had Tychicus was the mailman delivering the letter to him. Paul's in jail in Rome when he wrote this. And there in jail in Rome, he says, they that are with me greet you. And if you look at the list in Colossians, you'll find out that there is a, Aristarchus is with him. Marcus is with him. There's a guy named Jesus, but he's Jesus who's called Justice. <laughs> So, uh, it's not Jesus Christ, of course. But then there's Epaphras, there's Luke, there's Demas, there's Tychicus. Oh, that's the one who's bringing the letter, by the way. And then there's Onesimus, who was being sent back. He was a slave, sent back to uh, Philemon. And that's what the book of Philemon is all about. Because he's a runaway slave that Philemon could put to death if he wanted to, because he was the owner. But Onesimus got saved when he was put in jail with the Apostle Paul. And now he's going back to his owner as a brother, not as a slave. And Paul's got some instructions concerning that. That's what the book of Philemon is all about. But all them people, that's, that's eight different people. When Paul says, they that are with me greet you, you know, the, I know some grace churches don't have eight people in them. <laughs> Paul in jail in Rome's got a congregation of eight, and that's only the ones that, that the people at, at Philippi might be familiar with. There's probably a lot of other prisoners, and you're going to see in a few moments, uh, other people that are uh, fellowshipping with the Apostle Paul as he is there in jail in Rome. What an amazing thing, because that actually leads to, to where we're going there, is look at, again, chapter 4, and then he says in verse 22, all the saints salute you, now notice this phrase, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Wow! <laughs> it's not just that list of people that are in, uh, in Colossae there that, that send their greetings to the Philippians that are with Paul, but he says, uh, chiefly, when he names all the saints that are with, uh, uh, the brothers salute you with, uh, anyhow, it's a, again, verse 22, all the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Now, this causes us to think about a couple things here. Paul is in prison. He names how he's in bonds. He said that in this chapter already. But, he, but, but even though he's in bonds in prison, hold your place here and come to 2 Timothy and you might hold 2 Timothy. I want to show you another verse there in a few moments. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'll just tempt you without declaring what these verses are talking about by starting reading in verse 7. Where he says, 2 Timothy 2, 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. There is a gospel message that was given to the Apostle Paul when he writes in, in, in Acts chapter 20 verse 24, he calls it the gospel of the grace of God. So he just says, remember Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein, in him preaching the gospel... And by the way, him preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, as he writes these prison epistles, he calls himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ for us Gentiles. He says, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. 
but the word of God is not bound. The Apostle Paul might be in jail, but he, he has a clear thought about this. Him being in jail doesn't bind the word of God. That the word of God goes out. The word, when Paul was in jail there, he wrote prison epistles, which is what we call it the capstone of God's purpose and grace. It's not only we are saved, we learn how we are saved by Paul's pre-prison epistles. He writes, he starts out telling you how to get saved and, and what your salvation means to you, who you become when you get saved as a member of the body of Christ. Those things are written while, before Paul ever went to jail. But when he was in jail, he starts telling us God's eternal purpose for saving us. What God's future plans and eternity is for us. I keep going like this. Most people know we're going to heaven. No one before the body of Christ was ever promised to go to heaven forever. There, the, the Lord said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He gave Abraham the promised land as an everlasting possession. Abraham's not going to heaven. The Jewish people that are called out and God's people from the Old Testament, they're not going to heaven. God, at the end there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. God's got some people to occupy the earth. But God's secret purpose, he has some people now to occupy the heavens. And you even read in the book of Revelation of Satan and his angels being cast out. And I already told you, we're going to be raptured up. Why are we going up? Because God's got a purpose for us up there. So anyhow, when Paul wrote those prison epistles, though, that's what you start learning in the prison epistles. Aren't you thankful he was put in prison? Couldn't travel anymore, so he starts writing letters. The word of God is not bound. There he is in jail. But it's not bound even through his preaching. There he is in jail, and he can talk about those that are with him, and they're carrying these letters out as he writes them. But then there's these other people, even of Caesar's household, that, are, that know the Apostle Paul, that are considered saints, that salute the Philippian people here, so that now there's people in Caesar's household getting saved. And so the gospel continues to go out. That's why I said this conclusion is, Paul talks about the fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, even unto the day of Christ, right? Paul's still ministering the gospel even though he's in jail. The word of God is not bound. His ministry didn't end when they threw him in jail. He's just carrying on a jail ministry. So that tells you that things happen in life and there becomes life-changing experiences that you might experience someday. But experiencing those things doesn't end your ministry. It might change how you do the ministry and where you do the ministry, but it doesn't change the ministry. That God's will is for people to understand the gospel. That's the basic thing. And then to learn his word rightly divided. To, to, to know the truth of God's word. And, and so Paul's just in a new location doing ministry in a different way. But he hasn't quit. Now when I say life changing, maybe, you know, here's confinement. There are men, I mean, Bob Barlow, we just talked about. He's in China, teaching English, but taking the opportunity to share the gospel. The government finds out about it, throws him in jail. You think that ended his ministry? No. He's teaching people in the Chinese jail about the gospel. He just preached the gospel there. That's why they beat him. He won't stop. So, so life-changing experiences take place, and you might do it in a different place, and you might do it in a different way, but the ministry continues on. So in confinement, if you got confined, you know, I'm a complainer. That's <laughs> my personality. And, and sometimes in complaining, what you're saying is, I can't do it anymore. Remember, remember when Paul got, uh, a, it's called a messenger of Satan, an infirmity in the flesh. Now I think that probably is a physical eye problem because of what he says to the Corinthians. It actually implies that the look on him was kind of a tough thing. And, but, but it's called a messenger of Satan. Well, one time I thought to myself, instead of always studying about, you know, what, did he have an eye problem, was it this problem or that, I thought, what's the message? If it's a messenger of Satan, what's the message? Well, the messenger of Satan, the message is quit. Paul, God called you to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Next thing you know, you can't see. Can you imagine getting on a ship? We're studying in, in the book of Acts, him on a ship, and that ship's about to be wrecked at sea. Now everybody else has got some opportunity to get... Paul, if he has a blindness problem, if he has an eyesight problem, that's pretty difficult. But to maneuver, can you imagine travel all over the world? And, and not being able to see real clearly? That, that'd be a problem. Write letters and can't see real clearly? You see why he dictates so many letters. You could understand that, that the message would be to him, look, God, he prayed three times, Lord, take this away from me. And you're thinking that I need to, you've got to take this away, otherwise I can't do the work of the ministry. 
And then if he doesn't take it away, then you can say, well, then I quit. But Paul didn't. He said, God's grace is sufficient for me. And my weakness, he's made strong. And then Paul travels the world, <laughs> goes, I mean, the world's a dangerous place. There's thieves out there. If he has an eye problem, you can't tell if it's a friendly person walking up to you or a thief. And he talks about all the different times he was robbed and everything. It was a tough world to live in. Now here he's stuck in jail. Time to quit? No, just can't travel and preach, so I'll just sit here and preach. But he keeps preaching on. So confinement doesn't change anything. I mean, it might be a life-changing experience to you. Health problems can be a life-changing experience to you. Does it change your duty, your calling, your responsibility? No, it doesn't. The death of a mate has got to change your life. It's got to be a drastic thing. Does it change your calling, change your ministry, change your duty? You know, we live in a time in which, whether people are part of the reason or couldn't help it, divorce takes place. Someone gets divorced. Used to be, I used to hear it say that, you know, there's certain men, they committed a sin or they got divorced, now they're on the shelf. You're only on the shelf if you believe Satan's message. Divorce will change how you can minister, where you can minister, but it doesn't change the fact that you still have a ministry. Only, only if you believe the lie of Satan. You can get past divorce, and you can go on serving the Lord. You have to do it in the capacity that God says to do it in. There, you might not be the, uh, a bishop in a church, an elder in the church. There's other places, other places to minister. But it doesn't end your ministry. Life-changing experiences doesn't change your ministry. Even sin. There have been people whose sin has gripped your life and drug you down to the lowest of life. But if you get a handle on that, by the grace of God and understand your identity in Christ, put that away, your life's not on the shelf. In fact, it offers you a whole new avenue of ministry in an area that you never knew before. So think about that. Here's Paul in jail sending all these greetings, and among the greetings are they that are Caesar's household. They're, they're sending so, uh, this greeting so that Paul has a ministry there in jail, and his ministry is continuing on, and he hasn't quit. Not only has it continued on, you know, the book of Acts, go back to with me, to Acts chapter, I think it's 23. I'll, I'll just see it when I get there. We have learned in the book of Acts, unlike, especially some Christians today that are always mocking government, uh, the Apostle Paul got along with all the Roman officials. Uh, sometime he used some leverage. He got beaten at Philippi illegally. And the officials told him, get out of town. He said, no, wait a minute, guys. <laughs> Look what you did. And then they asked him, real politely, <laughs> to leave town. <laughs> they realized they didn't have the force anymore. So Paul knew how to use law to his advantage. But he learned how to get along. Here he's in jail. Back here he's in uh, Caesarea. And... Uh, and, and, and look at verse 24, uh, chapter 24, by the way, not 23, chapter 24, verse 24. It says, after certain days when Felix came, now he's the governor, Paul's in prison under his authority, and it says, Felix came with Drusilla, which was a Jewess, and sent for Paul and heard him concerning faith in Christ. Now here's a governor, and he's got this guy who claims that he's seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Felix has got him in jail. He's got a day. He's not too busy. He's thinking, you know, I, that guy who calls himself a, an apostle, he's also a prophet, says he saw the Lord, the risen Jesus Christ. I, I, I want to hear about this. So go get that prisoner and bring him to me. Not for a court case, just because I want to hear what he has to say. And now Paul's going to do this. It says, and he, Paul, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled. Paul, when Paul came, he reasoned with him of righteousness. God is holy. Where do you stand? Short. That's where you stand. The old expression that if, if God is here and you're here and there's a gulf in between and, and, you, and God says, if you can jump and reach me, you can live with me. So one guy jumps and misses by one foot. Another guy, he can't get, hardly get off the ground. He only goes one foot. Do either of them make it? Some people are great sinners. They hardly get off the ground. They go right down. Other people, they're not so bad as sinners. They go a long way, but they all come short. 
So he reasons with him of God's righteousness and your shortcoming, you have negative righteousness. But then he tells Felix about uh, righteousness and then temperance. Temperance is holding off something. It's not reacting right away. God has not reacted right away to man's sin. In fact, Paul is the messenger of the dispensation of grace. Grace is God's offer of salvation to the world. There's coming a day, and what was coming in, in the day prior, like moments <laughs> from beginning, God was about to pour out wrath on this earth. God raised up Saul of Tarsus and made him Paul the apostle of the Gentiles to go out and tell the Gentiles that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God could look through the cross and see them reconcilable and offer them by His grace salvation. And Paul says this is the day of salvation. It's a dispensation of grace. God's dispensing grace. He's holding off His wrath and His anger and looking through the blood of Christ and saying, be reconciled. Trust my son. I don't want to damn you. I don't want to send you to hell. I want to save you. So he taught Felix about righteousness, temperance, but what was the last thing? The judgment. Judgment is coming. For those who do not get saved in this age of grace, there is coming a time where God's grace will end and His wrath is going to be poured out on this world and there is going to be a lake of fire and there's even going to be Him coming back and ruling the nations with a rod of iron and those people who dis rebel against His rule while He's on the earth, they'll be cast alive into the lake of fire and then finally death and hell are cast into that lake of fire for all eternity after the thousand year and put away from God's presence, from God's sight, from the sight of the world. So when Felix heard about Righteousness that comes short. Temperance, God is waiting. The judgment to come, Felix trembled. Well, there's more reason than I, I want to share that with you. But this man, here's Paul in prison. He's not even in Rome yet. And sharing that message, it says, But Felix said to him, Go thy way for this, for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. And he hoped also that money should, be ha should have been given him of Paul. Just like any politician, pay me off, I'll let you out of jail. <laughs> but look at the last part of that. Now that's why he, he does this, but he does it nonetheless. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener and communed with him. <laughs> Here's Paul, a prisoner, having communion, not in the Lord, but having dinner and spending a lot of time with the governor of Caesarea. You know, there, when you read the book of Romans, when he writes Romans, he talks about Herodian, my kinsman. Herodian, that's a name that's attached to Herod. And when Paul writes to Rome, to the people at Rome, there, he knows there's a guy of, of, of Herod's household that's saved. When you read that passage in Philippians there where Paul says, especially they that are Caesar's household, that the, when you read the commentaries, they'll all tell you, well, that's not Caesar's family, that's Caesar's servants. And the servants of Caesar, some of them got saved by the Apostle Paul. How do they know that? Now, I, I understand why they're saying that. Because a servant is part of your household. So the servants are part of the household. But to go through and say, well, that's not Caesar's family. How do you know that? <laughs> if, if, if these other governors, and by the way, as you go through the book of Acts, Paul, there's other governors and kings that sit and talk to Paul. Bring him forward just for, the no, for, for no other reason, just to hear what he has to say. Do you think that Caesar, when he got there, that Caesar himself might have said, you know, before we have this court case, that guy's supposed to be a prophet of God, bring him to me. Maybe Caesar's kids, wives, are around. Begin to ask the Apostle Paul a question. You know what Paul's going to share with them. You don't know if it's not even some direct descendants of Caesar himself that got saved. There's no reason to think not, in fact, when you study the passage. But the point is, is that here's Paul in prison and the ministry hasn't stopped. So that when we consider chapter 4 of the book of Philippians, we learned in that chapter to rejoice in the Lord always. We learned in that chapter that by, to be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication let your requests be made known unto God. We learned in that chapter how to be content in all things. You think Paul's content in prison there? Absolutely, that's where he's writing it and telling us to be content. So, so much content. Content doesn't mean 
I'm retired, now I don't have to do the work of the Lord because I'm stuck here in prison. He's content to do the work of the Lord there in prison. He's learned in whatsoever state therewith to be content. And there he is in prison, ministering, continuing to minister. Look at now, I told you I was going to have you look at another passage in 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy 4. We've read this several times. It's just so impressive. Second Timothy chapter 4 in verse 17. Now by the way, if you don't know, Second Timothy is the last book Paul wrote. The capstone of Revelation is now complete. The last thing he said, now he, he's been waiting to stand before Caesar. There's apparently two times he had the opportunity. He says in verse 17, uh, verse 16, it says, At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it will not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Well, I bring that, if Caesar's household, do you think they might have been gathered together in that court case? That, that was the court case of the century. Here's this man that the Jews hate so much, who God has revealed himself to, a message of grace for the Gentiles. Paul, when he had the opportunity to speak, it's not so much defending himself, trying to get out, it's making the gospel fully known. He's preaching the gospel with boldness. And he says, all the Gentiles got to hear. Maybe that's where some of Caesar's household got a hold of the message. But in either case there, Paul made it known, and he says, the last thing he says in that verse, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Interesting statement. It doesn't take much to realize that the Bible takes Satan and calls him a roaring lion, seeking whom he may not, might devour. The, the lion here that he's delivered out of is, is out of Satan's hands. Satan is trying to stop the message of grace. Don't want anybody to know that. That's the last thing Satan wants anyone to know. Trying to put Paul to death, but before Paul dies, he has this opportunity and everybody gets to hear it. Gets logged in the Roman books of what this man says he saw and what the message is for God's Gentile, sal Gentile salvation in this age of grace. All recorded there, God delivered him out of the mouth of the lion. You know anybody else that was delivered out of the mouth of the lion? Somebody said Daniel. Daniel. A king liked him. But some people didn't like Daniel, so they made the king make a decree which they knew Daniel would fail to keep. And that is not to pray to anyone but the king, any petition. And when, when they caught Daniel praying, they told the king, and since it was the king's law, he had to fulfill the law, he had to throw Daniel to the lion's den. But he said to Daniel, he said, the God whom you serve can deliver you from the mouth of the lion. Now, Daniel was delivered physically from the mouth of the lion. We realize in the dispensation of grace how we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We're not just talking about physical deliverance. Paul died shortly after this. He said just before writing this, the time of my departure is at hand. But spiritually, Paul was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Satan didn't have his way. God had his way. And the gospel goes out to the Gentiles. So that leaves me the concluding verse of Philippians chapter 4. It says in verse 23, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now that's not just a little statement at the end. And by the way, that is not Paul bestowing grace. The grace comes from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of Paul's books start that way. It's God, God who is extending mankind grace and peace be unto you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul's saying here at the end, it is a salutation in the sense of he's saying his closing remarks, but what he, he's not bestowing it, but he is reminding them of the blessedness that we have of God's grace with us. That, that the departing salutation is a, uh, a reminder that God is continuing to extend his grace to us Gentiles. And that grace comes to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's with us always. Interesting, Paul's epistles begin with grace to you and peace from God the Father. 
and every one ends with a benediction of grace to you and then some other remarks. But Paul begins his epistles with grace and he ends his epistles of grace because he is the apostle of the dispensation of grace. Now if you don't know what I mean by that, read Ephesians chapter 3. God saved him to give him a message of grace for the world, not a message of wrath. And just like Paul is the one who ushers in the dispensation of grace, his epistles conclude with grace because we live in this time period of the dispensation of the grace of God. Our life will be all when, when, un, until the day of Jesus Christ. It ends with grace, where God ex, calls us up into heaven and we're with him. It's after we're caught up into heaven that the world will suffer another dispensing of God. This one will be a suffering one. He's going to dispense his wrath and his judgment on this world in order to cleanse it so that Jesus Christ can come back and rule and reign for a thousand years and show them how the world should have been run and then eternity future is going to take go on from there. But as Paul begins grace, so it is that God calls us by grace, keeps us by his grace. We're encapsulized in God's grace, undeserved, unmerited kindness, sealed unto the day of redemption. But don't forget that even though Paul learned to be content, he was content so he could carry on the ministry of getting the message out. That's no matter what takes place in your life, your fellowship in the gospel, your calling, our, let your conversation become as it become the gospel of Christ. Paul says that whether I see you or be absent from you, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The book of Philippians. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that each person here might understand how much you love them and how great your grace is. That we who come far short, not just a foot away, come far short of your glory. That you loved us anyhow and sent your son to die on the cross and totally paid for our sins so that you could freely give us eternal life. And Father, you didn't just give us a life to begin. You gave us a life of service for you here and now as well as a, a, a service for you throughout all eternity that we can read about when we study Paul's epistles and your calling for us. Father, we thank you for a book of Philippians that has taught us to center our fellowship there and to be grateful for all the saints that are, have their fellowship in the gospel of Christ. In his name we pray, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.